preaching. I'm just simply saying this. The Word of God's going to have the final authority in my life. I care what the sickness looks like, what the tragedy looks like. For me and my house, we're going to serve God and we're going to stand on His Word. Because I've based everything on the Word. I've gave it all. I, I'm all in. Have you ever played poker? I'm all in. Some of you are like, yeah, every Friday night, Pastor. <laughs> I'm all in on this thing, man. I'm a fanatic. I guess that's what we could call ourselves. I just really believe that Jesus said what he meant, what he said, and he said what he meant. And when it said, by his stripes, you were healed, I believe that literally in this life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm just going to break it down and slowly teach you some things. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so this might not be one of your hooping and hollering and shout me down messages. But I can promise you, if you'll open your heart, you'll leave here today with a revelation that God wants you well. And if you don't have that understanding right now, that's the reason why a lot of you are still sick. Because you still think somehow, some way that your situation is exclusive from every other situation. Or your situation is unique. Or, you know, or, 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 or most of the time I hear this. Something about you not receiving your healing is based upon something you did or didn't do. And that's a lie from the pits of hell. It's not got nothing to do with you. It's got everything to do with Jesus. And he's already done it. Amen. Go with me to Isaiah 53, and let's just get right into the Word of God this morning. And I believe God's going to do something supernatural in this place. Isaiah 53. And if you're joining us, we've been in a series called Exchanged. And basically what we've been looking at is three areas that exchange the moment that you put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week I opened the series talking about his rejection for your acceptance. That's what exchanged the moment that you turn to Jesus and you put your total faith and confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. Immediately, you didn't have to carry rejection anymore. Why? Because Jesus carried it for you. Amen? And what this does now is it makes you totally accepted before God. And I like that word accepted because I don't know about you. I shared a little bit last week. But, you know, there's a lot of times in my life I didn't feel totally accepted. Come on, I got any help in here this morning? Sometimes you just felt like, you know what, you wasn't on the in crowd. Some of you are going through that right now. You just feel like, you know what, Pastor, I just never feel like I fit in. I'm always feeling rejected. Well, guess what? Jesus was despised and he was rejected among men. Why? So you didn't have to carry it anymore. And I'll tell you something about acceptance. It really does a whole lot for your walk with God. And I said the first thing it does is it sets you free. I don't know, there's not another freedom in the world, liberty, knowing that you're accepted with the Father. I mean, knowing that He accepts you right where you are. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to get your act together. You don't have to quit dipping and smoking and chewing and going with those who do. You can show up right now in the presence of God, and He's not going to love you any less or any more, no matter what you're doing now in your life. He has totally accepted you on behalf of Jesus, and that's a good place for an amen. Freedom. I said it gives you a boldness. Acceptance gives you a boldness like never before. I don't know about you, but when I know I'm accepted, I just have this fire on the inside of me knowing that God loves me. And it don't matter what kind of hell I'm going through, I have a boldness knowing that the King of kings and the Lord of lords live on the inside of me. And I tell you, man, there's something about that simple truth that has radically changed my mind and changed my life forever. I don't care what people think. I don't care. I'm bold for Jesus. Amen? I'm bold for Jesus. I, I, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the situation is. I'm like a bulldog. I'm going to catch and hold on. And I did a lot of hog hunting growing up, man, I tell you. I have to, one of my favorite creatures is a bulldog because I've seen him 140 pounds. I caught hogs that were 350, 400 pounds with one catch dog because he'll never let go. He'd catch on the side of the head and it didn't matter, be hours and hours. And that bulldog's not turning loose. You know what? We got to have faith like that bulldog. We got to have bulldog faith tenacity that it don't matter what it don't matter if you're dragging me through briars and dragging me through a creek bed I'm holding on I'm not turning loose I'm not letting go that's the fight that's the good fight it's the good fight of faith and the last thing I said anybody remember I said acceptance gives you peace 
There's nothing like having the peace of God at night when you lay down. Come on, amen? Isn't it good that you now have been made peace? Romans says that we've been justified and have peace with God through Jesus. I don't know about you, but there was a lot of years of my life I didn't have peace at night. A lot, a lot of years, man, that I laid up at night staring at the ceiling. Thinking about this life, thinking about the next life, thinking about the choices I made and the consequences that, that I had to deal with because of the choices. I can tell you right now, one of the greatest things about my relationship with Jesus is, let me tell you, pastor sleeps good at night, glory to God. Amen. Tara says, too good. I keep her up snoring. But I sleep good, why? Because I have peace with God. I've made peace with God through Jesus. Through one sacrifice forever amen or yet isaiah 53 so today i want to talk to you from the subject of this his wounds for our healing what an appropriate subject for such a service this morning if you notice the songs me and pastor mike don't talk about what songs to play but if you notice we had several songs that were talking about the healing power of god we had the healer and I, what was the other one somebody help me out his love is everything. Well, I guess that'll go along with healing. But glory to God, it was in there, right? <laughs> it's in there. It's like ragu. It's all in there. Isaiah 53. Last week we looked at Isaiah. And just to give you a context, this is a prophetic text concerning the Messiah. And I tell you, man, it would do you some good to get to know Isaiah 53. And it would do you some good to learn to do a Greek word and a he or a Hebrew word study. We're going to talk a little bit about some Hebrew words today because I want you to leave here with an understanding because sometimes we gloss over the word of God, never understanding what the word really means. And you can get around people and they go to teach in nonsense and things that are not true because they haven't done their homework. Come on, amen. Am I preaching good this morning? And so they begin to, to take on uh, uh, meanings of things that they don't have any understanding. How many of you know you, you can take some something at face value and never really know the true meaning of something until you dig beneath the surface. Sometimes you got to plant your butt in the chair and study a little bit. But again, we like the microwave generation, don't we? We want to download the app. Huh? Come on, am I preaching good? I got the app. Open it up, it's already there. Well, sometimes we have to be diligent. I think that's why the Lord uses that word many times. He says, if you're diligent, if you seek me, You'll find me. You know, when you're seeking something, you're pretty diligent about it. You ever lost any money? Come on. Lost, lost your wallet? I lost my sunglasses Friday night. I can tell you I about tore the church and the house up. They were $60. I didn't want to buy a new pair. But I found them. Amen? How many of us, if we would just get like that about the Word of God? And we'd get diligent about digging into the truths of God's Word. Listen to me. He didn't make it hard, church. You don't have to be a theologian. Just look at your pastor. You don't have to be, you know, a scholar. He made it real simple. He made it for fishermen. He made it for tax collectors. And he made it for you and me. But we do have to get in it. We do have to study it and not just read it. I, I thank God for reading. I think you should read several chapters a day. But there's something about reading and studying that separates the men from the boys, if I could use that term. Or we could use the women from the girls. So we don't be biased. But there's something about digging beneath the surface and finding out the truth of what's God's word. He hasn't hid anything from you. But you do got to dig for it. You do got to search. You do got to look. Amen. Isaiah 53. And so last week we talked about his rejection. Today I want to pick it up. Let's pick it up. Well, let's just read back in Isaiah 53. It says, he is, or, or verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid him, or we hid it as if we were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely, I like that. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was wounded. Underline that word in your Bible. Wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, underline that word, for our iniquities. 
and the chastisement of his peace was upon him, and with his, underline that if you have that word, his stripes, somebody help me out, what, say it again, we are healed. Fast forward with me to Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to look at one verse, and that's going to be our reading today. Matthew chapter 8. Some of you know where I'm going with this. I love the Bible because it, it's commentary on itself. If you want to know something in the Word, keep reading because you'll find it again. Amen? Because it's commentary on itself. You know, I'm all right with commentary, but don't base your theology on another man's commentary. Amen? Because the Word of God will commentate on itself. Everybody understand that? I use commentaries. I use Andrews. I use a couple other people. But you know what? I first let the Holy Ghost begin to show me. And then I may use a commentary to see if I'm off the path. You know, Paul did that. Paul went to Peter and them later on and wanted to make sure the gospel that he preached was the same gospel that they preached. Because how I many you know, Paul received it by revelation. Amen? He said, this thing I got, I didn't get from man. He said, I got it from the Lord. And so he'd been preaching this thing for years. And, and he said, I wanted to make sure what I was preaching, you know, was what they were preaching because I didn't want to run in vain. Come on, amen? So it's all right to, to find out if you're on the right track. But make no mistake about it, the Holy Ghost is the teacher, amen? So I said what? Matthew 8. And in verse 17, the scripture there says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, somebody help me out, himself took our what? Infirmities and bear our sickness. I like what the Amplified says in Isaiah 53, 4. If anybody has one of them, surely he has borne our griefs, sickness, weakness, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. I like that. Now, I want to show something to you this morning. The Hebrew word for griefs is choholi. The word interpreted disease and sickness. You can write these down for references because I really encourage you to go and study this out for yourself. Don't just take pastor's word. But in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 15, the word choholi for griefs is translated sickness. In chapter 28 and 61, there again it's translated sickness. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 17, it's translated sickness. 2 Kings 1 and 2 and 8 and 8, sickness. Are y'all getting my hint this morning? 2 Chronicles 16 and 12 and 21 and 15 is all translated sickness. This word does not mean grief in the sense of emotional sadness, but it means sickness, including and not excluding physical sickness. Why do you think Matthew says what he says? So Jesus knew that some people would get it wrong. Come on, amen? That some people would twist it and malign it and say, you know, it's not for today. And so Matthew does such a brilliant job to say, just so you don't get it messed up, just so you don't get it twisted, or confused, I'm going to put the word right there, infirmities and sickness, so you'll know that Jesus died for your sickness and your infirmities. Come on, somebody. So you never have to carry them again. Glory to God. Amen. He said, I, I just want to I just want to make it real plain for you. Because there's a lot of teaching in the body of Christ today. And I'm just going to shoot this dog this morning. Amen. Because I'm sick of hearing Christians talking about what God is limited in doing and a limited atonement and all this nonsense that's being taught. So at least I know one thing that you're going to be taught the truth at Grace City. Amen. You may not agree with it and you can be wrong. <laughs> but I'm going to teach the truth of God's word. Now. Here's the great thing. You know, people say, oh, pastor, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not seeing it and all that. You know, I'm not seeing this. I understand that. I understand the reality of when we know the promise and we don't see the manifestation. But you know what? I preach the gospel to a lot of people. And I don't see everybody getting saved. Come on, amen. But that doesn't discourage me from preaching the gospel. Yeah. I'm still going to preach the gospel. Is anybody following me? Just like I'm going to lay hands on everything that moves. 
Anybody that's got sickness in their body, if they'll let me, I'll lay my hands on them and believe God with them. And you know what? I put myself at rest a long time ago about the manifestation because the manifestation's not on my end. I'm doing what I'm told to do, and that's lay hands on the sick. I, I have an altar call for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you know what I find? I find that most of them won't receive it. I'll lay hands on some and they'll get it and they'll begin to pray in their prayer language and I'll move right on to the next one. I don't worry about it. I used to get stuck on that. Oh my gosh, I wonder. And spend 20 minutes trying to minister about something that you just freely received just like you did when you received Jesus. We talked about this last week or Friday night with uh, Pastor Byron was preaching. You know, for me, I didn't, it wasn't some big showdown at the altar and everything. I just saw it in the Word. I knew it was for me. I got in the shower. I said, God, if this is, this is still going on today and this is for me, I want it. And by faith, I started opening my mouth and words began to well up. And from that day forward, I never stopped praying in the Holy Ghost. But see, you got so much wrong teaching today. And, you know, people are waiting for some glory cloud to come out of the sky and a fireball from over here. And you got these mainline Pentecostal churches that are shaking people up and going, hold on, let go, turn loose, let go, stop. And you got people going, man. Anybody been a part of that? Yeah. Tarry in the altars for 15 hours. You don't have to tarry one minute. Just come up there and say, Father, it's mine. I thank you that you said that I would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In fact, in Luke chapter, in, in Luke's gospel, in 11 and verse 29, he said, You being an evil father know how to give good gifts. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost that those who ask him? He didn't say those who beg and, and tarry and wait and fall on the floor and beg and cry and weep and all those things. He said, all you have to do is ask. Ask. Some of you are going, Pastor, I don't believe that. And that's why it don't work for you. Because you've got to believe it. Amen. Hey, I don't have any guarantee that I'm saved. Do you? You got some physical, you got some physical tangible evidence? I got what the Word says. I got what the Word said. And the Word says that when I believed on Jesus, the Spirit of God came and dwelt on the inside of me. That's good enough for Pastor. Amen. It's the same way when you receive anything from God. But again, this isn't my message, but that's where the wrong teaching. That's just like with healing. It's just like with healing. It's getting it from the spirit man, which is already reality, to manifest in your physical man. And guess what? Most of the time we drop out of the race when it doesn't happen overnight. Because we think everything's instant. Everything happens like that. And so somewhere along the way we get stuck. Let me teach you another word. The word sorrows is makab, the Hebrew word. It's rendered pain in Job 14.22 and 33 chapter 19. Usually pain associated with sickness. That's why Matthew actually translates the word as disease. Isn't that good? Yeah. Learning something today. Y'all going to walk out of here speaking Hebrew. <laughs> Let's look at the word salvation or save how many scholars do I got in here what does anybody know what the word means sozo save sozo is translated made whole in reference to physical healing here write these scriptures down and, and go and study them out Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 22 Mark chapter 5 and in verse 34 and in Luke's gospel 8 Chapter 8 and verse 48. But I like this one. James 5 and 15. Remember the, the scripture there? We prayed it just a few minutes ago over Pastor Mike. It says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That word is sozo. The prayer of faith. And I've heard some... I'm going to just hush about it. I've heard a lot of people go around a big circle to try to discredit. But simply, what are you going to do with the word sozo? Well, that wasn't meaning physical healing. The word sozo, yeah, it means healing, but it means emotionally or spiritually. Come on, man. Really? Jesus came to redeem the whole man. That's why you're going to get a glorious new body, because God don't do nothing half done. So people say, well, what does it matter? Are we going to get a glorious? Because God's going to redeem everything that he lost in the garden, church. 
That's why you're going to get a glorious new body. And that's why you're going to get to eat chocolate cake. Come on, amen. Jesus ate dessert. He ate honeycombs. I'm going to get me some chocolate cake. Seven layers. So I want to give you a couple things this morning. Write this down. Pastor's crazy. No, don't write that down. Number one. Healing has been paid for. Healing has been paid for. I'm going to use a churchy word. And I know we're a church that tries to reach unchurched. But catch me after a service. I'll break it down for you. This is the word I want to use. Because this is most people who understand this word. And that's the word atoned. If we could just insert that word, healing has been atoned for. The word atonement means this, to satisfy, to amend, or to be reconciled. I like that. To satisfy, how many know when Jesus poured out his blood on that cross and said it was finished, he satisfied the wrath of God, he satisfied the judgment of God so that you and I could not only be free from sin, but be free from sickness, poverty, and everything else that this fallen, broken, messed up world has to offer. I'm preaching better than you're responding. Thank you for that one amen. Let me give you some examples in the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, when they would atone for, they would bring the sacrifice to the priest and he would take the blood and he would atone for the sins, the diseases, and the plagues of a person or people. Did you know that? Let me give you an example. Three examples in the Old Covenant. The first one, let's look at the Passover lamb. You can find this in Exodus chapter 12. Everybody knows the story, right? They had the mass exodus. Uh, the Lord directs Moses for the Passover feast, which was actually a type and shadow of the Passover lamb, who was Jesus, who was slain before the foundations of the world. Everybody got that? We've got to do this quick and summarize this, but f just track with me. And so during this, he's given specific instructions and I believe every one of those instructions were critical for you to understand because every part of it painted a picture of what Jesus was going to do and fulfill the scriptures he was the foretold Messiah and so he told him to roast the lamb with his with his insides his head everything on it they were to pick a lamb first off that was a male and it was without spot or blemish that means you couldn't go in the back and get the messed up one come on amen you had to get the prettiest one in fact I read that most of them would take the lamb into the house and actually love on it, cuddle it, and keep it inside their house like you would do, you know, my pit bull Lydia. But then later on, they would see it roasting over an open fire. I think there's significance to that. But they would get the lamb and they would, they would prepare the lamb. They couldn't keep any more for the next day. How many know? Because God wants you to have fresh him every day, right? Amen. All this is types and shadows, just like the manna. And so they were to eat a little bit. They were to eat the lamb and then they were to discard the rest. They weren't allowed to keep any of it because God wanted them to know that he was his source, that they were his source. And so the, notice the children of Israel were kept from the plague. You know what happened? The angel of the Lord flew over all the houses. And how many of you know that he told them to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost of each house? And, the, and when the angel, the death angel, saw the blood, guess what happened? He went over. What was going on? They were being atoned for. They were being atoned for. The result that Israel kept the plague from coming to their dwelling. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Christ is our Passover and has been sacrificed. Glory to God. Amen. What about the mass exodus? We see in Psalms chapter 105 and verse 37. You know what the scripture there says? There wasn't a feeble one among them. Now I want you to try to put out of your mind what you saw on the Ten Commandments movie when you saw everybody with crutches and eye patches and sick because I want to tell you there wasn't a feeble one among them. There wasn't not one that was weak. Why? Because everyone was healed. In fact, they said their clothes didn't wear out, that they didn't need anything. God was their healer. Exodus chapter 15, I am the Lord God who healeth thee. What am I sharing? I'm showing you in the Old Covenant. So that I can get you to the new. Listen to me. It was atoned for. It was paid for. Listen to what happens when the atonement 
stop the plague in Numbers chapter 16 and verse 46 through 48. It says, then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them. The plague had already started coming against the people of God. And he said, hurry to the assembly. He said, the wrath has already come from the Lord and the plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and he ran into the midst of the assembly and the plague had already started among the people. But Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. How much greater is the blood of Jesus? Another example in Numbers 21 and 8 and 9 it says, Again, the Israelites brought judgment on themselves. You remember where they were bitten by poisonous snakes? I love the story. And so here's the solution God gives them. He says, it's real simple. Take a bronze snake, put it on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by the snake and they looked to the bronze snake, they were healed. You know why? Because John's gospel records in chapter 3 and in verse 14 that Jesus said this about his own crucifixion. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Glory to God. Toned. Healing has been atoned for through the blood of Jesus. Understand that today. We have a far greater covenant and we're going to get into covenants in a few seconds. But our covenant is far greater than what they had. And they had healing in their covenant. Do you understand me this morning? There was healing in the covenant. The old covenant. God was their healer. How much more today does the blood of Christ heal all of our sickness and take away all of our affirmities? Number two, quickly. Healing belongs to us. Let me tell you something this morning. Healing is the children's bread. It belongs to us. It's a covenant right. But we need to understand covenants. Most people cannot rightly divide the word of truth. They see God as a schizophrenic in the old covenant. And they don't understand that everything that Jesus did appeased and satisfied God. And so they're still living with an old covenant mindset thinking God's waiting over the balconies of heaven with a big stick ready to bonk you on the head when you get out of line. How do you have a relationship with a God like that? Let me tell you something. There was wrath in the old covenant. But if you don't understand it, you cannot harmonize the new covenant and understand that Jesus took the wrath, that he took the curse, that he bore everything in his body. And when he said it is finished, he meant what he said when he said what he meant. There's nothing else for you to do on your part but to believe and put your total faith and assurance in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is a great place for an amen. we got whole churches today that are still trying to somehow add to what Jesus did. Paul said, if you take anything or add it to it, it is no longer the gospel. It has become perverted. And he said, you know what? If an angel bring you anything or I let him be accursed. Church is full today, still adding on to the gospel. Taking away, adding to it. Except the finished work of Christ. And what he did on that cross was sufficient for every single thing that you'll ever need. It belongs to you. You know, I like a covenant. It's a contract, usually between two people. You know, if you guys have ever bought in a house, how many in here are homeowners? Did you like signing that contract? Especially if you have a balloon payment at the end. But what happens is you know what you can expect from that other party, right? We enter into a contract. Well, you know, in the old covenant, the contract was all about you do this and God does this. Just read chapter 28 in Deuteronomy. See the blessing and the cursing. You do this, this is what you get. And you know the people of God entered in and said, we shall do everything that was written. How dumb were they? How dumb can you be and still breathe? We'll do it all, God. They occurred the wrath of God. Why? Because it never was about them doing anything. It was about them looking to a Savior. The law was never meant. It was a schoolmaster. Everybody understand that? In fact, read Galatians. You need to really read it. Really, 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 really read it. And and meditate on it and reread it and reread it. It was a schoolmaster. It was a tutor to bring you to the saving. It was to do two things. Here's the purpose of the law. Number one, you couldn't keep it. 
And number two, you, because you couldn't keep it, you needed Jesus. That was the purpose. So if you're living under the law today and you're trying to keep the Big Ten, I know there's churches teaching that. Stop it. You really need to read Paul's letter in Romans in chapter 7 when he gives the marriage example and he talks about when you're married and he says when you're under the law and a woman's bound by the law of her husband. Y'all remember that in chapter 7 of Romans? And he starts talking about this marriage. But he says if that husband dies, she's free to marry another, right? Follow with me? Guess what he says about the law? When we are no longer under the law, now we're free to marry Christ. So now you're married to Jesus. Hey, guess what? When you're in love with Jesus, you ain't got to worry about the Big Ten because you're not committing murder and adultery and stealing and all these things. Everybody understand that? But if you're still trying to be justified and made righteous by keeping a list of do's and don'ts, let me tell you, my friend, you do not have a revelation of the gospel and you have fallen from grace. That's what fallen from grace means. God, just preach on that for a minute. Oh, he's fallen from grace. You know what fallen from grace doesn't mean you're in sin. It means that you are now trying to perform and trying to earn favor with God and trying to get acceptance from him and trying to be in right standing by something you do or don't do. And that, my friend, is fallen from grace. Jesus has provided everything that you need and you need to focus on Jesus. Now we could spend the rest of this time talking about what that fruit should look like in your life. But we're not teaching on that. But the purpose is this. Your eyes should be fixed on Jesus. Fall radically in love with Jesus and the rest of it you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about every day doing a moral inventory and going, did I lie today? Did I steal today? Did I do that right? No, fall radically in love with Jesus and sell out to Jesus and quit half-stepping. Come on, amen? Quit having one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom and fall radically in love with the man Jesus. And I can promise you, you ain't got to worry about those other things because the Holy Spirit is in you and he'll begin to speak to you and move you and correct you through his word. Notice I said correct and not condemn. Because he doesn't condemn. Jesus took your condemnation. Hebrews chapter 8. While we're on the subject. Turn there quickly. Got to build a foundation. I can't, I can't really teach on that. I need about four weeks to teach on this subject. I really do. I knew this when I got into it. And. Let's look at verses 6. We're talking about a better testament. We're talking about, if you look at chapter 7, we're talking about the priest line of Melchizedek. And we're talking about how Jesus came. There was thousands of years, nobody ever, no other priest ever came from the Levites. But Jesus came from Aaron. And they're talking about this contrast. And when we pick it up, and in verse 6 it says this, But now hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by, na by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Notice what he says. A better covenant. Which was established. Somebody help me out. On what? On better promises. Why? Because the covenant's not with you and God anymore. It's with God and Jesus. Does everybody understand that? The covenant's not with you. You're a beneficiary to the covenant. Isn't that awesome? You get everything on Jesus' behalf. That's why Paul could say that we are co-labors with Christ. Because you are now the beneficiary. Isn't it awesome if you become a beneficiary of a will? Huh? You didn't work your whole life and earn all that stuff, but you find out you got a rich dead aunt over in the other part of the world, and you get a call from a lawyer one day and says, guess what? Your aunt has left you the beneficiary, and you are now worth $1.7 million. How many would all be excited about that? Well, how much more should you be excited about the promises of God that you've been made a beneficiary through the blood of Jesus? Not according to the covenant that I made. Oh, this might mess some of you up. Well, let's back up a little bit. He says this. For if the first covenant had been faultless, hmm, then should no place have been sought for a second. So he's saying if the first covenant huh, was the final covenant, it was faultless, then why did we need a new covenant, right? Follow with me. 
For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and they regarded not them not, saith the Lord. So he said, it's not going to be like the days before where you did and I do, you did and I do, I do and you do. It's going to be all about what he did. And he's going to write these new laws on our heart by the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad for that? That's why you can see Gentiles who didn't know the law but knew the law after Jesus. Why? Because he said he put an intuitive knowledge on the inside of us. And when we have the Holy Ghost, how many of you know? He's the witness. He's the one that calls the balls and strikes. Amen? He's the one that steers the boat. He's the one that says, no, you don't need to get over there and do that. No, you need to get back over in here. Why? You don't need it written down on stone and tablet. You just need to get your eyes fixed on Jesus and let the Holy Ghost lead you every day. Amen? He says, for the covenant that I will make in the house of Israel. And listen to this. And he said, that shall not teach. He said, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord for all, for all that shall know me from the least to the greatest. And I love verse 12 and 13. Let's read it together. He says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about the new dispensation of grace where he's no longer going to count your sins. Paul says it this way. He says, Sin is not imputed anymore. Aren't you glad for that? Has anybody ever been in accounting? You know, an imputing is an accounting term. It means to be put on the ledger. That means when you have a debt, that there's something that's put on your ledger. Let me tell you something. There's no more sin being put on the ledger to your account. Because Jesus went in and he paid it. In fact, let me say this. He overpaid your account. One drop of his blood would have been an overpayment of the entire world. And let me remind you that John said it's not even your world, not even your sins. The propitiation of your sins, 1 John chapter 2. But he says, for the sins of the world. Man, that's powerful. We're watching the passion of the Christ last night and it just brings back the reality of what he went through. I just think everybody ought to watch it once a year. I hear Christians say, well, I can't stand to watch that. It's, but they watch all this other filth, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all this other nonsense. I know I'm preaching good, right? But can't watch what our Lord and Savior went through. You know what that tells me? You don't want to take an honest evaluation and look at what he went through for you because we like to picture the Jews up there nailing him to the cross. But let me tell you this morning, it was you and me that had a hammer and a nail and we were part of it. Verse 13, he says this, a new covenant he has made, the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth, Old is ready to vanish away. Somebody got a different translation? Read. Anybody that has a different translation than the King James? Read that last verse. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to just slap the devil right now and just say, I am free from the law. You ought to just charge hell with a water pistol right now. He said it's a better covenant. It's a better covenant. It's based on Jesus. Because he took your sins and, his, and your sickness into his own body. And by his wounds you are healed quickly. Galatians 3.13 it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Have becoming a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So let me just share with you a few things that the curse brought so you'll understand. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says fever, inflammation, painful boils. Anybody ever had a rising? Severe lingering illnesses, disease and leprosy. Would you call that sickness? So that he bore that. He hung on a tree and became a curse so that you didn't have to carry that. You don't have to carry that junk no more. Pastor, you don't have to carry it no more. He carried it all the way to the cross for you. 
according to Paul. Jesus took every sin and sickness on the curse of the law and bore it in his own body when he hung on that tree. Glory to God. And the last one, healing is for today. You guys can stand. If I could get some land and music. Healing is for today. No matter what people have said, let me say this to you. Everybody look at me. God hasn't changed. He's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In fact, in Malachi 3 and in verse 6, he says this, I am the Lord God and I change not. He ain't changed about your situation. His mind ain't changed about anything that he's already provided through the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 40 says this, he says the flowers may fade and the grass may wither, but the word of God stands forever. Glory to God. Well, if the word of God stands forever, then you know what that means, church? That means healing is for today and it belongs to you. And this isn't to condemn anybody to leave here today feeling condemned, but I'm just simply saying this. Why would you want to carry it anymore if somebody else already paid for it? That's like going to a restaurant, me and Byron, he buys my dinner and it's already paid for and I'm still trying to pay the lady at the counter. And she goes, sir, I'm already... The guy that you're eating with is already paid. I know he's already paid for it, but I want to pay twice. Can I just pay for it one more time? It was so good. It's foolish, isn't it? How do you think God thinks? When we're trying to carry it and we're trying to hold on to it. When Jesus already bore it. When he took those stripes. And let me tell you, Mel Gibson did a probably one of the better jobs that I've seen in the Jesus films. But I can promise you it was worse than that. When his flesh was being torn and plugs was being ripped out of his back and they rolled him over and began to beat him on the other side, church, every one of those stripes was for you to be whole. Was for you to be delivered in your mind and delivered in your body from any sickness and any infirmity. He said, and Jesus, you need to read, you need to read Hebrews. I'm telling you. Hebrews ought to be one of your best books. And I believe it was Paul that wrote the book and that's another message. But let me tell you something. He said he's not sending them back to the cross and putting for an open shame. He's not doing it. He went one time into the Holy of Holies with his own blood and showed it and sat down at the right hand of God signifying it is finished. It is done. He's not standing ministering anymore like the old covenant. It is finished. You know, he says that we can walk in righteousness over the power of sin and everybody don't do it. So I understand everybody don't walk in healing, but I can tell you right now, it belongs to you. And I'll say this, this may hurt your feelings, but I can promise you it ain't on God's end. If you're not getting your manifestation this morning, and it's not, it's not on God's end. God's not withholding any good thing from His children. Don't you leave here. If that's the lie you've been taught, I'm sorry. But I've come to tell you the truth. He's not withholding any good thing from his children. Poverty and lack and sickness and all that's from the devil. It's from a fallen world system. It's of the curse and it doesn't belong to the children of God. And I wish I could teach on this for a month. i got to hit this and go. But I pray the Holy Spirit took what I said and communicated it to each one of you in a special way so that you leave here today knowing this, God wants you well. He wants you whole, spirit, soul, and body. Father, we love you. We worship you. And we say today, Lord, that you bore those stripes, that you took that sickness for everyone in this room that we didn't have to carry it any longer. And right now, Jesus, by faith, we declare we are the healed of God. We declare we are the delivered of God. We declare today, Lord, that you became poor that we might become rich. And you wasn't talking about in spirit. That you provided everything that we need in this life. That we can walk in victory like I say all the time. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. Glory to God. And so today, Lord, we declare... Say it with me. Say, Jesus, I receive every good gift. I receive my healing into my body 
into my mind, into my soul. It belongs to me. It's mine. You provided it for me, and I receive it right now by faith. I leave today with sickness left behind, with poverty left behind, with tormenting thoughts left behind. I leave fear today. And I leave in faith in the Son of God. The Son of God. Father, help us today. Help us today, Holy Spirit. Open up our hearts, open up our minds to receive your word, the truths of your word, God. Make it real to us today in a special way, God. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for what you did on that cross. We thank you for the ransom that was paid, the debt that was paid on our behalf. We don't take it lightly today, God. We're serious about this thing. And we don't dare carry another thing that you paid for. We leave it all behind today. And we walk out today in total victory, knowing that you already won the victory. And we thank you for it. You are so good. You are so awesome. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, as we go back into this song, you're